Welcome to the session, Carbon Markets, a conversation with Bill Gates, Mark Carney, Annette Nazareth, and Bill Winters. My name is Nicole Schwab. I'm the co-director of the Platform to Accelerate Nature-Based Solutions at the World Economic Forum, and I will be your moderator for this session. We are delighted to have you here with us for the launch of the final recommendations of the Task Force for Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets. This task force was launched in the fall of 2020 to answer the following critical question. How can we build well-functioning voluntary carbon markets that can support net zero and carbon negative climate goals? The group consists of 50 of the key industry experts, as well as another 150 experts in a consultation group who serve to challenge the recommendations throughout the process. With us today to talk about voluntary carbon markets and the task force, we have a fantastic lineup. We have Mark Carney, UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance and the initiator of the task force work. Bill Winters, Group Chief Executive of Standard Chartered Bank and Task Force Chair. Annette Nazareth, Senior Counsel at Davis Polk and former US Securities and Exchange Commissioner and the operating lead of the task force and Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft and co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We will spend the next 30 minutes to dive into the recommendations of the task force with our panel. And if time allows, we will try to take a few questions from the audience. So please use the chat function to send us your questions and comments. And if you are watching this session on social media or the website, you can also share your reflections with the hashtag WEF21 or hashtag Davos Agenda. So with that, let's go straight to the heart of the matter and let me turn to you, Mark. What is the role of offsets in the context of a 1.5 degree climate ambition? Well, thank you, Nicole. And uh, let me compliment the, uh, the leaders of this uh, task force. It's a remarkable achievement. Uh, first thing to say is that this carbon budget is very precious uh, on business as usual. So pre-pandemic uh, emissions, uh, we have less than a decade. Uh, of a carbon budget um, uh, to stay remain within uh, one and a half degree temperature increases. So it is a limited carbon budget. And in that context, uh, really a voluntary carbon offset market does four things. Uh, the first, it's complementary, I underscore that, complementary to companies' efforts to reduce absolute emissions. Companies' responsibility, first and foremost, is to reduce their absolute emissions. And uh, as the report says, they need to first reduce then report, including net zero plans. I'm sure we'll get into the specifics of that. And then, only then, uh, look to offset. Um, the second thing that this does is it is catalytic. It's catalytic not for uh, renewable projects in many advanced economies where the economics are absolutely clear, um, they're, they, they are profitable and they will be driven, but they're catalytic for projects uh, that many of which are in emerging and developing economies where the economics are not yet quite there. Um, and this can help tip the balance uh, for those projects to come in. They also, this, these offsets can also be catalytic as part of helping the economics of absolutely essential breakthrough technologies that need to happen for us to ultimately get to net zero. And I'm sure that will come up uh, more clearly because uh, Bill Gates has, has led uh, on those technologies. The third thing is uh, this market is cross-border. Um, this market is being driven, it's a voluntary market, but it's being driven by companies making these net zero commitments, most of those companies, the vast majority of those companies are in um, the G7 uh, uh, advanced economy, so-called advanced economies. They will be looking for high quality, high integrity offsets. And most of those offsets will come from uh, emerging and developing economies. So this is a potentially huge cross-border flow. And then the last thing, and I'll hand back to you, Nicole, is that this uh, market has the potential, prop again, properly structured, to have enormous co-benefits, um, co-benefits for biodiversity, co-benefits for other uh, SDGs, although rooted in a high integrity, highly credible, open, transparent uh, carbon offset market. Thank you, Mark. Let me turn to you, Annette. So we understand the importance of getting to net zero, but the voluntary carbon uh, markets are not new. However, until now, they haven't achieved scale. Can you tell us what is different about this initiative and how it is going to help us achieve the Paris ambition? Sure. Thanks, Nicole. Well, you're correct that there is a voluntary market that is already operational. 
Uh, and it has made strides in terms of credit integrity and transparency and efficiency since its earliest days. That said, from experience, we know that there are structural challenges that need to be addressed. In our blueprint, we set out six topics for action with uh, 20 underlying recommendations that we believe will materially enhance the market to make it more robust and transparent and further increase the quality and environmental integrity of carbon credits and their use. Each of these topics for action and recommendations are important levers, but to me the three most important elements that will really help us achieve our goals are quality, government, governance, and legitimacy. Quality comes through the development of a set of core carbon principles, which we refer to as the CCPs, and additional attributes. These principles set out threshold quality criteria to which a carbon credit and the supporting standards and methodologies should adhere. This is a foundational step to ensure quality and also for forming the basis for reference contracts. Reference contracts will in turn drive liquidity and price transparency and allow more high quality projects to be financed. The second element, governance, is critical. We have to get a governance body in place to oversee the CCPs. This should include embedding transparency, standard setting and oversight of verification of emissions reductions from projects. It will also include ensuring projects boost biodiversity and carbon capture while respecting community and land rights. And beyond overseeing credit level integrity, a governance body should oversee participant level and process level integrity as well. And finally, legitimacy. We focused on developing a strong and legitimate demand signal. Nothing will happen unless demand is in place. But having said that, organizations need guidance and clear standards on when offsetting is legitimate. We need to see transparent climate commitments from firms that include how much offsetting they plan to do in the coming years. Companies should publicly disclose commitments, detailed transition plans, and annual progress against these plans to decarbonize operations and value chains. Industry consortia, similar to Corsia, for other heavy industry sectors can also move the needle significantly. And clear and aligned narrative on offsets and what claims corporates can make will also help drive demand. So again, quality, governance, and legitimacy are crucial drivers, and I think that those will animate our work in the coming days. Thank you, Annette. So quality, governance, legitimacy, let me turn to you, Bill Winters. Why aren't we doing this already? What problems stand in the way, and how does the report address these? No, I, I've, been, uh, I've been around the voluntary carbon markets for probably 30 years. And at various points, got very excited uh, about the prospect of this market really taking off. But as, uh, as Mark and, and Annette both said, uh, it didn't. Uh, it's there, uh, but it's nowhere near as robust as it needs to be uh, to get us to, uh, to net zero by 2050, which, which is something that uh, already 1,500 corporations have committed to. Uh, I guess that the, the majority of businesses in the world will commit to that. We've seen countries uh, committing to net zero, but we know that the real carbon mitigation and, and the car carbon reduction is coming from businesses, uh, overwhelmingly from businesses. So of course, individuals and consumers can, can contribute as well. Uh, what do we need to do to get this market properly scaled up? I think that the first thing that's changed fundamentally is that we've made these commitments. The, the fact that net zero is even a term, uh, not, not just a term, but used by 1,500 corporations already. And I guess after this week, it will be many more. Uh, if we refer back to uh, letters that are coming from the owners of any of these businesses, I'm thinking specifically about the letter from uh, from BlackRock uh, just this week, it makes clear uh, that, that every corporation in their portfolio will need to have a very clear plan to get to net zero. Uh, and in those plans, they'll be very clear that you must start with reductions. And this is really Mark's very first point. Uh, every business has to start, uh, and the bulk of the, of the migration to net zero is going to have to be improving our own carbon intensity, reducing our own emissions. And that's recommendation number one in our task force. And not something that we spend a lot of time on because we're focused on the voluntary market, but clearly reduction has to be first and foremost. Uh, but we also know that it'd be very difficult for many businesses to get all the way to net zero, much less uh, carbon negative as, as Microsoft has committed, uh, without tapping into the offset market. 
Now, why, why offsets? Well, it's, it, offsets are the, the most convenient and efficient way to migrate the tens of billions of dollars that need to move from the hands of people like my bank, Standard Chartered Bank, into the hands of the people that can actually remove carbon from the environment uh, or structurally reduce carbon in the environment in the most efficient way. Uh, in addition, we have the, the tremendous benefit of creating uh, price transparency, which has all sorts of other benefits, not least in terms of making clear to those of us that are polluting in any way, what the cost of that pollution is. So what's different this time? Uh, number one, we've got these, these net zero commitments that have been made. Number two, the, the, the stakeholders that are urging us to make these commitments, our owners, our employees, our clients, are intending to hold us strictly to account. So this idea that you could buy an offset that was uh, occasionally referred to as a greenwashing contract, it's simply not going to work. Uh, as Annette went through, we've, we've got, uh, and we spent the last six months developing the standards uh, and the standards setting bodies, the governance oversight to make sure that we are using the latest and best technology instruments and with the right level of transparency to be absolutely certain that these carbon offsets or carbon credits that are being created are legitimate, that they're permanent. Uh, so they, it's not here today and, and gone tomorrow when, when the forest burns or, or the tree is cut down. Uh, tracking leakage, so leakage outside of the project uh, in terms of, of gradual diminution of the effectiveness and making sure that these projects are additional. Uh, additional meaning these are projects that wouldn't have happened but for the fact that there was a, a carbon benefit to the, uh, to the climate. So these are the, the, the steps that we've taken. Uh, as Annette said, you know, 20 recommendations uh, lumped under six key themes uh, with 200 uh, participants very actively involved. What we're coming out with today, and I hope everybody gets a chance to read it, is a 17-page executive summary, easy read. Uh, you, you can definitely get through that. The 139-page report, you've got to put a bit of time into. Uh, but the, 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 the opportunity for all of us is to take this framework that we put out today and to convert that into an implemental act, in, implementable action plan this year so that we can start to see the real benefits of scaling up this market immediately. Because without that, we will not get to net neutral carbon uh, net zero in 2050. Thank you, Bill. Let me now turn to you, Bill Gates, and, and you are also the founder of Breakthrough Energy. Um, and Bill Winters just mentioned technology, and we know that nature-based solutions are going to be a critical part uh, of the solution to achieving net zero, but what else is needed? Well, I'd say the, the good news is that a lot of companies uh, are taking carbon into account as they make decisions. They have you know, some per ton hurdle price uh, and they you know, are going to stay away from investments that uh, you know, are, are generating carbon uh, because of that price signal. The big step, uh, the next step there is getting people to monetize those things uh, and put that money into things that are provably have an impact. Uh, and a number of companies now uh, are uh, willing to do that. Now, some of these offsets are very complicated. Uh, you know, trees, for example, uh, have a 40-year lifetime on average. Uh, so to match the carbon residency time, you'd have to replant 250 times. And uh, trees generally grow where there's good soil and good uh, water. And so the number of places where you can do those 250 plantings is very, very small. Uh, so, you know, over time, the understanding and the quality of these efforts will go up. Uh, you know, as I went to do offsets for myself personally, uh, you know, long-term uh, offsets, uh, the prices were about $400 a ton. You know, that's very, very high. And everything we think of here, it's 51 billion tons of emissions. And so everything has to be considered as a percentage of that. For a company that's a... a electric utility, a steel company, a cement company, any sort of industrial thing, uh, you know, you, you see the increase in price uh, that they'd have to have uh, is still significant. So uh, innovation is going to be key to this as we do the carbon markets in parallel uh, with funding the, the innovation activities. Thank you. Let me turn back to you, Mark. Um, some say that offset markets are just greenwashing and that it lets companies off the hook, allowing them to buy their way out of doing anything. 
what would you say to that? Uh, well, I, I categorically reject it. Um, and I think the part of this is putting companies on the hook, this process that Bill Winters referenced, uh, you know, we have 1,500 of the world's largest companies are now in a position where they're making these commitments. All of a sudden, once you're in making those commitments and participating in the type of offset market that this uh, report recommends, um, it's not just a commitment. Uh, it's a commitment which is, has a net zero plan which is rooted in science-based targets, if those are available for your sector. And as, as those watching will know, that is spreading across the sector. So you, not just a plan, not something you've written on the back of a napkin, one rooted in science-based target. Annual reporting requirements, that's one of the recommendations in terms of uh, your absolute reductions. And then alongside that, if you are using offsets, well, offsets that come from a market that has the type of transparency and integrity that Annette and Bill have, uh, Bill Winters have uh, outlined. But let me just reemphasize. So there, there's those elements. It's, it's, it, it brings companies into a, it's part of what brings companies into a formal system. And by the way, all stakeholders around uh, those companies will be scrutinizing and have the information they need to scrutinize in terms of absolute reductions and those offsets. But just if I can make one last uh, adjacent point, if I will, uh, which I started with, which is this is about preserving or, or conserving, maximizing the use of a very limited carbon budget. And what are we supposed to be doing during that time? We need to do two big things. One, we need to turn over the capital stock for proven economic technologies like re uh, existing renewables that solar, wind, and others to get emissions, absolute emissions down. And secondly, we need to put big money and a lot of focus and a lot of smart people around the type of breakthrough technologies that we need ultimately to get to absolute zero, uh, where, uh, whether around hydrogen, direct air capture, or sustainable jet fuels. And so we need, we need all of that, which is why I started with this is complementary. It's one piece of the puzzle, but we do need this market. Thank you, Mark. Annette, I know that uh, uh, you went through a, a public consultation. So what, what did the public tell you in the consultation and what were some of the other concerns that came up and how did those inform what you will do next? Thanks for that question. You know, uh, we've been very fortunate to have a very broad engagement for the task force's efforts. Of course, we benefited from the work of a very engaged uh, task force itself with the members uh, representing a broad cross section of the value chain, uh, but we also had uh, very valuable input uh, from our consultation group, which uh, I believe we mentioned before, which was subject to, uh, com composed of subject matter experts from over 120 institutions. So we took all that input and then we put out a draft report during our consultation process. And we were very uh, pleased to receive over 160 responses during that consultation period. Uh, the reception to the uh, report has overall been really quite positive with 73% endorsing the blueprint and 88% agreeing with the need to implement the six topics for action. So, you know, the full debrief of the feedback can be found in the report itself, um, but some key takeaways for me were on credit quality and governance and reference contracts. Um, on credit quality, we received feedback from across the value chain that solving the issue on quality, including permanence, leakage, and additionality, which Bill Winters uh, mentioned before, uh, has been highlighted as a top reason for getting mass adoption. On governance, we had 77% agreement for stronger governance for all identified governance needs. And for reference contracts, respondents were in favor of the development of standardized reference contracts, including over 60% of the buyers uh, who responded uh, who would commit to purchasing through such contracts in the future. So concretely, uh, this input led us to the conclusion that we need to address um, a few additional steps. First, uh, to drive up quality, uh, we need to get one level deeper on the CCPs, which includes designing specific guardrails per project, for example, renewables only in least developed countries, and to review historic credits to ensure that they would meet the high quality criteria of the CCPs. On the governance process, we have to get more specific on the roles and responsibilities and help propose a way forward for uh, its establishment. And on reference contracts, 
the task force can help develop the contract templates that will be used by market participants to trade. So again, overall, I think we had a very productive and informative consultation process, and it's certainly going to inform our work going forward. Thank you, Annette. Bill Gates, I have a second question for you. Um, how do you see the role of private sector climate commitments to drive the scaling up of voluntary carbon markets, and what is the risk of getting this wrong? Well, I think the way forward here is to connect the uh, this private sec these private sector payments <clears throat> to innovation. If you just have you know some wealthy companies that aren't in the industrial sectors where the green extra green cost would make their products non-competitive, if they're just dealing with their portion, it's a very small percentage. On the other hand, if you're taking this uh, offset money and you're bootstrapping the markets uh, for the difficult products like green cement, green steel, green aviation fuel, uh, then you can start the learning curve. And as you get that volume and learning curve, then these premiums can come down. Because after all, you know, to be at zero by 2050, all the products that <clears throat> middle income countries buy for shelter and lighting and transport, you know, are going to have to come at such a small premium that they're willing to shift all their purchasing. And so taking uh, the lesson from solar energy where uh, country policies drove up those volumes uh, and the prices came down and now shifting that to the hard areas, uh, including industrial uh, and things like uh, green hydrogen, if we can take this money and start those learning curves. Uh, uh, and so we're driving up the volume and, and causing success and more innovation to get those premiums down. Then I see these voluntary carbon markets and the acceleration of innovation uh, through the marketplace as really com coming together uh, and giving us that chance of getting to zero. Thank you. Uh, last question to you, Bill Winters, before we turn to questions from the audience. What are the next steps and how will the task force strive for fairer representation? Uh, uh, good question. We spent a lot of time thinking about representation. And that mentioned that the 50 uh, member core uh, task force with another 120 people in a consultation group and, and, and many others that were providing advice or perspectives, including the 160 uh, responses we got to the consultation paper. Uh, but there's a there's an overweight in the task force and the consultation group in the developed markets. So we have uh, good representation from Indonesia, from uh, from China, from uh, from Latin America, uh, but not enough. And when we look at the at the the carbon equation in the world, uh, something like ninety percent of the of the uh, practical uh, major base solutions, the, 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 the target areas, are sitting in developing markets. Uh, whereas on the flip side, something like ninety percent of the of the natural offset buyers, at least so far, are coming in developed markets. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we that, that we balance that out so that we really have the both sides of the market uh, represented in, in the efforts as, as we get into uh, to finalizing the, uh, the the implementation plans to, to take this framework and put it into reality. Uh, some have said that this uh, that this will that the, the, the carbon offset market will relate to will result in a, a meaningful transfer of wealth from uh, from the developed to the developing economies. There is clearly some truth to that. We know that the developed uh, economies uh, are ahead, they're certainly in Europe. Uh, they're uh, well ahead in terms of establishing infrastructure and, and also mindset. Uh, and we know that the developing markets, uh, number one, are most exposed to the effects of climate change, uh, but also uh, can have the, the most important marginal impact from here in terms of, of improving their, uh, their emission efficiency. So uh, clearly the, the, the key for us is, is, to, is, is to have uh, this market be as inclusive as we possibly can. And we wanna make sure that we, we bed that down during the implementation phase. So next steps, um, we obviously are beginning today with, with the, the next round of stakeholder engagement. Uh, we had really good, strong, robust feedback uh, after the consultation document. Uh, these issues are not without controversy. I mean, there are people that have focused on this market for years. And, and, and Nicole, your very first question was, you know, why, why now and, and why hasn't it happened before? Well, the reason is it's, it's tough uh, and we've had to change some things uh, and, and the world has had to move on. Uh, now we need to bed that down and, uh, and, and take the, the controversy and resolve it. Uh, I think we have a reasonable shot at getting something close to consensus. 
Uh, but th th there may be some uh, some naysayers, and we'll want to make sure that we understand those concerns and, and factor those into our plans. Uh, second is to get the, the governance frameworks in place. So we've, we've made recommendations for what the governance should cover. Now we need to actually create the governance body uh, that can in, in many ways be the self-regulating uh, organization for this market and can, can address the legitimacy and quality issues that you talked about. Uh, we need to get uh, the, the standards agreed, both for the car, core carbon contract or the core carbon principles, as, as Annette mentioned, uh, but also for the, uh, the, the, the nature of, of transactions that are happening off uh, outside of uh, the core standards. So, uh, and we'll continue to work on, on addressing the, the remaining issues around the integrity of the carbon market, the legitimacy of the market, uh, making sure that, that we've got the latest and, and best technologies and, and capabilities to, uh, to track the quality of these instruments. Uh, and that, that work has, has already begun, of course, but we'll begin now in earnest for the broader uh, population now that our report is out. And uh, we urge the most inclusive possible uh, set of interactions with, uh, with everyone in this, in this community that, uh, that all has the, sh the same shared interest to get to net zero by 2050. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so you mentioned a number of controversies and I would like to now turn to the questions from the audience. And I would like to start with a question from Peter Backer from WBCSD. And his question is, in parts of the NGO community, there is a fierce, rather ideological debate underway about refusing the use of offsets to get to net zero. How does the report and the work of the task force help us to break through towards a more pragmatic approach? Who would they like to take this question? Mark, would you like to take this one? Yeah, well, why don't I start and um, colleagues can jump in. Um, I think the, the first thing is um, something we were talking about earlier, which is, um, and, and I mean, obviously having a legitimate market, a high integrity market where the offset is the offset and things such as uh, the point Bill Gates made about the role of reforestation uh, over the life cycle of reforestation and being absolutely clear about the, the transitory nature of uh, that form of offset, you know, subsequent, that's essential and that gets clear, first point. Second point, um, differentiation when it's necessary uh, in types of credits. Uh, so either on exchange traded or OTC uh, credits. Um, so it's clear what's being used and the clarity that comes from being in company accounts, because remember, ultimately, these offsets, and this is one of the core recommendations, not just of this task force, but of the overall COP finance process, is we want climate disclosure in companies' main accounts. Um, so it has that level of integrity. Uh, and, you know, CF, CEOs and CFOs don't sign off company accounts unless they know that it's real, um, either on the profit side or on the offset side. But then the, the, the process point, this will be my last one, but it's a critical one. And part of this will be finally nailed down with the governance body and the, and the final terms of the market. But there's some leading sense here in terms of the uh, principles in the report, which is if you're gonna be participating in this market as a buyer, you can't just show up and buy a few uh, offsets and, 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 and put them in your, put them in your window uh, and feel good about yourself. No, you actually have to have a comprehensive net zero plan. Um, and by the way, there are 1500 companies with net zero plans. Not all of those plans are comprehensive net zero plans, which would meet the standards of those markets today. This will help ensure uh, that those are the case. And then that number increases. Um, and then also what other requirements would be, will there be for those companies um, that uh, would include the annual uh, uh, reporting on the plan, the mark to market, the, the relative uh, contribution. So all of that is a way to enhance the legitimacy of this activity. My last point though, was my first point, uh, which, and, and Bill Winters said this, which is we're all looking for the same objective. We're all trying to get to net zero. Um, we need to, maximize our, our possibility of getting to net zero, our probability of getting to net zero. And this is part of the answer, only part of the answer. And it maximizes the ability to turn over the capital stock as quickly as possible and to make the kind of innovations that Bill Gates was talking about a moment ago. Thank you. Would anybody like to add something? Yes, Bill Winters. Very good. Mark, I think, summed it up perfectly. But I think the, 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 clearly at the heart of this of this question is <clears throat> a concern that the the offsets that are created in the first place we're never going to deliver the benefits that we're hoped for, or that they're slippage, 
uh, after the after the original agreement. And uh, when you read through our, our task force recommendations, you'll see that we, we tried to address those questions very directly, both both uh, at the outset and then over the life of, of the of the project. But the, the, maybe the, the thing I take most comfort in is, and, and this is getting back to you know what's different this time around. Is think about the number of people that are watching this time uh, who weren't watching before. Our owners are watching. Uh, our regulators, if you're in regulated industries, are watching. Uh, as Mark says, to the extent that some of these commitments make it into financial reporting, you got auditors who are watching. Uh, you got NGOs who are watching. And if you have a if you have a, a, a an orchestrated market, that these credits eventually are being delivered into an exchange. Uh, and somebody's on the other side of every one of those trades, and they're watching very, very carefully. Uh, and like every other market that we've seen that, that's, that's managed to get to critical mass, uh, the best way to make sure that people don't cheat is to have lots of eyes uh, on the process from end to end with, with complete transparency. So at the very heart of our recommendations is finding ways to make that transparency very evident at every stage of the process. And I think if we get that, the, the confidence that these credits are legitimate, not just now, but through the life of the projects, will soar. Thank you, Bill. I'd like to bring in a couple of other questions. Um, so this one on a slightly different angle uh, is a question from Jules Kortenhorst, RMI. And his question is, the focus of the report is the market for offsets. But as Bill Gates highlighted, we need to actually establish the pricing of the carbon attributes in the real economy to drive innovation and create the solutions for hard to abate sectors. Do you see the possibility to expand the voluntary carbon, carbon market scale up move in that direction? Would anybody like, yes, Bill Gates, please. I think <clears throat> some of the best money ever spent on climate uh, was what Germany and Japan did uh, buying solar panels when they were still uh, being sold at a high premium cost, which I call the green premium. And so companies' willingness uh, to fund activity, we need to connect that to the innovation cycle. Because after all, when if a green product is very high priced, uh, there's no market for it. Uh, but if you drive that volume up, then that price delta can come down. And so I do think that... Uh, really proving to people that the quality of, of these offsets is strong. That's over the next few years, we'll do better and better than that. But the other is the idea of this catalytic impact and getting some of this money to go into uh, taking the tough, the, the hard parts, the high green premium parts and, and getting those on the learning curve and getting companies that do that uh, that, you know, buy all their buildings with green cement, green steel, uh, and bootstrap like solar panels, we want to give credit to those companies because that learning curve is the only way that you get the entire market for those products to shift to green. Thank you. Uh, just, yes. just, just, just to chime in, uh, in it, it's clear in our, in our report uh, that Bill's enthusiasm for, for this angle is infectious. Uh, and we all agree uh, that it's critical that we find ways for the, uh, the, the, the voluntary carbon market to help support these, these frontier technologies. Uh, so that, that, that's, that, that's a, it's a central tenet. Now, did, do we have all the details of that worked out? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, and that I think will be one of the really important and challenging and interesting issues during the, the, the next phase of implementation is finding a way to get comfortable, but we can have the same sort of confidence in these frontier technologies that we have in some of the more established technologies where they have their own questions. Uh, but we're all committed to finding a way to do that. Thank if you, I, Mark. Nicole, yes, if please. I can just make one quick point, um, which sometimes uh, those at the frontier, it's hard for them to, to, to realize how far others are behind them. Um, so Jules, uh, I know Jules well, who asked the question, he's at the frontier. He understands these issues intimately uh, and the financial sector issues intimately and some of the technologies. Bill Gates, obviously, at the, at the frontier, some of these technologies. But one of the things that this architecture, this overall architecture does, companies having net zero plans, clarity on what is and isn't an offset, linkage of those offsets to breakthrough or catalytic technologies is it shines a huge light on what needs to be done, not over the next few years in terms of currently economic technologies get put in place, but what issues need to be cracked. And Bill Gates referenced some of them, you know, hydrogen, uh, 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 aviation fuel as well. And that will mean brain power, money, activity, innovation flows into that. So we get those 
technologies in, we, we maximize our probability is a better way to put it, that we're gonna get those when we really need them. Uh, and that's why we need this as part of the overall architecture. Last point, if just to reemphasize, if I'm a company and I'm offsetting, I get to make a decision, how many of my offsets, do I just wanna buy the cheapest high integrity offsets or do I want to buy offsets that also have co-benefits, biodiversity in, or uh, co-benefits, which are buying down the green premium in some of these key technologies? Um, and I will know which type I bought and I can disclose it and people can rely on that. That's what this market can help create. I think that's a great point, Bill, because I, 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 uh, Mark, because we, uh, you know, what we focused on as well were the additional attributes and being able to determine you know, in the capital markets, that that's where your investment is going to go to that kind of activity is going to be within the, uh, you know, within the remit here. And so I think it's going to, uh, you know, as, as Bill Gates said, really catalyze uh, this, these processes as companies decide to employ their resources for those purposes. Thank you. Uh, and I have a last question from M. Sanjayan from Conservation International. And that question is, one area of offsets, natural climate solutions, have huge potential as offsets, yet only attract 3% or so of the financing available. What is the panel's take on the role of nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions and its potential for cross-border funds for many countries in the global south? Who would like to start? I mean, maybe no. start, since that, uh, that's, that's also my day job. Uh, in addition to to what I'm doing on the on the, the task force, uh, the uh, we can look at this as as the problem, which it is, uh, is ten trillion dollars, uh, uh, something like three trillion per year, uh, that's needed in the developing economies to uh, get them on track to meet the the commitments that we all need to make to get to net zero. Uh, only about ten percent of that is making its way uh, into the right hands at this point, and we understand the reasons why. And that was pre that was pre pandemic. Uh, these, there's a, a country risk premium, there's questions about the efficacy of the, the implementation of some of the projects, uh, and there's a history of, of uh, projects that have been botched uh, in, in one stage or other of their execution. Uh, the, 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 the absolute, it's absolutely critical uh, that we deliver that, uh, that financing into those hands with well-structured projects. Now, the, the other side of the equation is, uh, if we're going to hit the sustainable development goals in the world, we need something like $50 trillion of capital to be deployed. Uh, over the next 10 years, right? and that's $50 trillion. And how much of that is available today? Well, most of it will become available, actually, uh, through a combination of, of normal risk return activities and markets, uh, together with, with government actions. Uh, so think about blended finance, uh, where governments are, are helping to catalyze this flow of money from the developed markets, typically, into the developing markets, where the, the, the bulk of the, uh, the uh, nature-based solutions are to be, are to be found. Uh, there's a role for banks to play in this. There's a role for capital markets. There's a role for governments. There's a role for multilateral institutions. Uh, but we, we can't wait too much longer uh, because, uh, as, we, as we understand, the, the candle is burning at both ends right now. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we could go on. Uh, there's a lot of topics. Uh, fascinating conversation. I would like to thank you all for, for your engagement uh, and for this great panel. Um, for those who are following on TopLink, we will post the links if you want to read the full report of the task force or the summary. And I also want to highlight that um, as a follow-up to the task force report, um, the World Economic Forum has issued a report looking at the critical role of nature to deliver on net zero and that we will be working to ensure high integrity, high quality uh, nature-based solutions, which is a critical part of, of what we talked about today. So thank you all. Um, you can find the recording of the session on the World Economic Forum website. And um, um, I look forward to, uh, you know, this task force really uh, gaining momentum and, and traction and with all the wonderful recommendations that you laid out. Thank you.